so hello everyone so we are today going to take uh, the third session of environment current affairs the most important topics for prelims okay so we'll start first we'll see which are the most important topics uh, for this year's uh, prelims i mean uh, the topics which we are going to discuss today okay so we'll start with the cheetah reintroduction program which is ha which has been frequently in news then we'll move on to great indian bustard uh, then we'll speak about the indian pangolin then about the red sanders and most important organization that is traffic uh, then we'll also see project tiger uh, conservation assured tiger standards on the tx2 awards which is related to the tiger conservation then we'll see the kelp forest uh, then kaziranga national park uh also the eco sensitive zone which was also in news like uh, too much in news this time uh we'll also see the biodiversity heritage sites along with that we'll also see the biological diversity act 2002 and also uh we'll speak about the national action plan for vulture conservation 2020 2025 and also valmiki tiger reserve apart from that we'll also see the durgavati tiger reserve and the program for the asiatic lion okay so these are the important topics we'll be discussing today so first we'll start with the cheetah introduction pre introduction project okay okay so what is this about cheetah reintroduction pro project this was a news very frequently in the last year right so it is the first intercontinental cheetah translocation project so why is this happening this is mainly because our cheetah became extinct extinct in the year 1952 okay that is indian cheetah became extinct and we asked africa for what to uh, to relocate the asian african cheetahs to from namibia and south africa to india okay so uh, this is was the main thing which was a news so we, we have like around eight african cheetahs from namibia and around 12 from south africa as of now which has been relocated to india okay so i told you this mainly because the wild cat that is the this cheetah became extinct in india due to extensive hunting and poaching okay so uh, by 1950s it got extinct okay uh, and we are trying to reintroduce this cheetah in a national park called kunno national park kunno palpur national park which is a national park in the state of madhya pradesh okay remember cheetah reintroduction is done in kunno palpur national park okay also there's one more important thing earlier this national park was what uh, a location which was uh, intended for the reintroduction of the lion okay it was part of project lion and it was proposed for reintroduction of lion but as of now it is changed for the reintroduction program of cheetah okay so upsc has already asked about uh, kunno palpur national park uh, in terms of relocation with regard to the lion population now it has changed to what the cheetah project okay okay so yes so when we talk about this we must also know about what the asiatic cheetah okay as of now the status of asiatic cheetah is critically endangered although it is extinct in india if you are talking about the iuc and red list it is now critically endangered so where is it found in the world okay it is extinct in india i already told about that but it is found in iran now okay only a few more cheetah is remaining and asiatic cheetah is remaining and they are found only in iran okay so in india it is extinct and it is found only in iran so the government of india asked iran that uh, if we can get a few cheetahs but they actually denied it so that is why we thought of what reintroducing uh, another species of cheetah that is the african cheetah so what we have reintroduced to kunno palpur national park is african cheetah and not the asiatic cheetah okay so what is the difference between asiatic cheetah and uh, the african cheetah okay the asiatic cheetah is smaller and paler compared to african cheetah okay uh, just remember this it is smaller and paler that is it and what we have in reintroduced now is the african cheetah and not the asiatic cheetah okay and uh, the status of asiatic cheetah is critically endangered okay so yes we must also speak about project cheetah which is the flagship pro program of the government okay so the uh, wildlife institute of india wildlife trust of india and moifcc together has started the initiative of project cheetah 
okay so according to this project we'll be translocating at least 50 cheetahs from this uh, southern african countries to india okay so all uh, uh, so countries such as namibia and south africa we are taking the Afri uh, african cheetahs from there and re relocating to the national parks in india for a period of 5 years okay so uh, that is the project cheetah also, we must know in the prelims point of view the habitat with regard to cheetah. There is a crown. Yes, we know it is Kunola Palput. We are reintroducing, and it has like what massive grassland species. It is a grassland species that is in Africa. It is found in Savanna region. Okay, it is grassland. Okay, so uh, that is the habitat for cheetah, and uh, this is essential for biodiversity conservation. Why is it so? So. We can call cheetah a flagship species or an umbrella species. So whenever we are conserving a flagship species or umbrella species, all the remaining species in that habitat would be conserved. So just by conserving this particular cheetah species, the rest of the species in that particular ecosystem would be conserved. That is umbrella species. Okay. So uh, remember, it is savanna or grassland ecosystem which a cheetah's habitat. They need like vast grassland where they can run about because it is one of the fastest animal on the planet, right? And it is what it is a flagship species. Okay. Okay. So yes, we already spoke about Kunopalpur National Park. Where this cheetah is going to be reintroduced? Okay. So where is this Kunopalpur located? Yes, it is in the state of Madhya Pradesh. In between what Aravallis and the Madhav National Park. Okay. It is actually a wildlife corridor. So, what is a wildlife co corridor? Yes, a path which connects two different what wildlife or forests. Okay. So it is uh, that path through which the what species such as cheetah, tiger, or elephants they travel. Okay, there is a corridor. They connect between two forests. So it is actually a wildlife corridor between what Aravalli and Madhav National Park. Okay. Initially, it was what a sanctuary in 1981, and recently in 2018, it was given the status of national park. Okay. And it is also national habitat for cheetah with vast grasslands, savannas, and open woodland. So why is this grassland so significant? Yes, the prey base, that is, the food for cheetah would be where found in grasslands that is the grazing species such as deer okay nila etc this is the food base for what or prey base for the cheetah so that is why they are introduced into the uh, they are usually found in the savannas or the grasslands okay yes so that is about the cheetah okay and uh, also we spoke about kuno palpur national park it is not just kuno palpur where we are trying to reintroduce. As of now, we are just introducing Puno Palpur, but there is also proposed uh, cheetah introduction programs in Shagar in Rajasthan, as well as what Nauradehi. Nauradehi in Madhya Pradesh. Okay. These are other sites where cheetah would be reintroduced. Here. Yeah. So, uh, when we speak about the cheetah reintroduction program, we must know about what, yes, the Indian cheetah, uh, sorry, the Asiatic cheetah and the African cheetah Indian cheetah is extinct uh, as of now. I mean, Asiatic cheetah in India is extinct, but it is only found in where Iran and the last population is around uh, uh, is less than 50 and it is, uh, the status is critically endangered. Okay. And also we must uh, look about what, yes, from where it is taken. It is from African countries such as Namibia and South Africa and it is reintroduced as of now. And yes, uh, also there is a good news that uh, the cheetahs which were reintroduced in Puno Palpur has, has already produced cubs. Okay, they have had babies now. Okay, so it is a support, so it is considered as a successful project. Okay, uh, and yeah, the national park which is being, it is being reintroduced is Puno Palpur, which was initially a site for what? Project Lion. Okay, for reintroduction, it's a, it was a site for reintroduction of Lion. Okay, apart from that, we must also know about the project Cheetah. Okay, which is a flagship pro program of the government of India. And also, what they are planning to look, relocate, translocate at least 50 cheetahs. Okay. And uh, we also spoke about what the species of cheetah and its habitat, where it will be from, especially in grassland. And it is also a flagship species. Okay. Flagship means uh, it is a face. It is 
that uh, that particular region's fish. Okay, and uh, umbrella species mean whenever it is conserved, the, the rest of the species in that region would be automatically conserved. Okay, uh, another example for umbrella species or flagship species is the tiger. Okay, okay. Then also we saw the rest of the national parks where it is it is being reintroduced. Okay, so we have Kunapalpur, uh, Shagar, and Narad. Okay. Okay, so then after that we will see that is about uh yeah, cheetah relocation program that is very important for this year's films because so many so many like times it was there in news, and from the time it was being brought from Africa to the time it was reintroduced and what are the major threats it will be facing? Okay, and also remember it is African cheetah which is being relocated and not the Asiatic cheetah. Okay. Uh, now we'll move on to the next topic that is great Indian buster. So this is the great Indian buster. Okay. Why is it important? Yes, it is the heaviest flying birds found in India, especially. Okay, it's around 15 kgs. And yes, again, this is also found where in dry lands or grasslands or scrublands. Okay, especially in states of Rajasthan, the desert national park. Okay. And it is the critically endangered species found in India. Okay, remember, great Indian bustard is the critically endangered species. Okay, so you can see the decline in population in great Indian bustard, like from in the last 50 years. So there was a population of 1260, and now it has fallen to less than 150. Okay, almost 90% decline in the population. Okay, and where is it is found? It is found in the western part of India, northwest, that is Rajasthan, Gujarat region. Okay. Okay. So, why was it in use? Yes, uh, the, recently the Central Electricity Authority has issued draft Central uh, Electricity Authority Regulations 2023. And what was it for? It was making it mandatory <laughs> for electric lines in the Great Indian Bustard area to be underground. So, we can see this is one of the major threats the Indian Bustard is facing, right? Uh, that is, whenever it tries to fly, it comes in contact with the electric lines in the in the region and it dies. Okay, just like we can see the crows die on uh, on the electric lines, right? So similarly, great Indian buzzard, when it is the heaviest bird, and whenever it tries to fly, what happens? It comes in contact with the electric lines and it dies off. Okay, so the recent guidelines of the uh, Central Electricity Authority regulations has made it mandatory for what electric lines to be underground in Great Indian Bustard. So it, through that, uh, through that you can actually conserve the Great Indian Bustard species. Okay. And uh, when we talk about Great Indian Bustard, we must know about its ha habitat. So yes, it is found only as in it is in, in endemic to Indian subcontinent. So if there is a question that if it is found only in India, that is wrong because it is found in India and Pakistan. Just remember, it is endemic to Indian subcontinent. Okay. Especially the scrublands and grasslands in Western part. Okay. Yes. And also, it's found in Desert National Park, especially in Rajasthan, Des Desert National Park, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Karnataka, and Andhra Pradesh, in parts of Pakistan. Okay. So, you can see the dryland regions of India. That is where this great Indian bastard is found. Okay. And there's also one interesting fact earlier, like, uh, when we got independence, initially we thought we'll make the great Indian buster the national bird of India. But then later we gave up on that and we made peacock the uh, national bird. But uh, if if great Indian buster had become the national bird, then much more conservation would have happened in that regard. Okay. Okay. So uh, we spoke about the habitat. Now we'll see what are the major threats. Yes, I've already told. It is mainly because it is it collides with what with power lines and uh, apart from that also wind turbines in the region. Okay, uh, this vast grasslands is also known for what we can please wind turbines. So when it whenever it collides with that, it dies off. Okay, and also yes, the habitat is grassland is also being depleted. That is drought and other things that is happening to dry air. Okay, so depletion of grassland, hunting is also a major reason. Okay. And also mines, okay, human activities such as mining, etc., also depleting the what 
the declining uh, is a cause for the declining population of the great indian bus okay so main reason is the collision with the power lines and turbine and also uh, depletion of grasslands hunting and the other human activities okay so we spoke about the habitats and the threats of the great indian bus stand so what are the initiatives that government has taken upon yes that is a project great indian bus stand which was what started by the rajasthan government in order to conserve this species is actually the national bird of rajasthan sorry state bird of uh, rajasthan and also it's locally called godavari okay so whenever you hear the name godavari remember which which species is that it is the great indian bustard okay yes then there is also another initiative similar uh, in order to what uh, reduce its contact with the electric line it is the firefly bird diverters so what is this firefly bird diverters yes so they are actually what uh, installing flaps that is that be colored flaps on the power line okay so whenever there is an electric line going uh, uh, above the uh, uh, busted area uh, they they install flaps okay and they act as reflectors so, so okay whenever so the, uh, the great in busters flow uh, i mean fly through that area from around 50 meters distance they can see this this uh, reflectors okay and they can change their path to avoid collision so that is the basic principle of what firefly diverters okay so you can see it here see so there is different colors like uh, fluorescent green red etc so whenever the busters fly they they see this the, the light gets reflected from here and they see it and then they change their path that is the basic objective to some extent this is effective but underground uh, what electric lines would be much more better okay so these are the conservation measures that the government is taking about with regard to what the great indian bustard okay so uh, remember great indian bustard is the critically endangered species uh, criti critically endangered species of india uh, this is also a favorite topic of upsc it has frequently asked about uh, great indian bustard okay uh, its region that is it is found where in, in the desert national park and also where another thing about it is that it is found in uh, it, it is native so endemic to indian subcontinent found in regions of west india and pakistan okay and the conservation initiatives of uh, great indian bustard ma is mainly what there is a project great indian bustard apart from that there is also what uh, the regulations that the electricity authority has passed to make man make it mandatory the electric lines would be below the ground also there is firefly diverts okay okay so that is it about what the great indian bustards now we'll see another species which was in news that is indian pangolin so what is pangolin it's also a pangolin okay yeah. so it is actually a species found in india and china and uh, the south east south and southeast part of asia okay and this traffic and ww of india has a uh, recently uh, brought out a publication titled indian pangolin buried in illegal wildlife way okay so that is why this was in news because this is one species which has high rate of illegal wildlife way okay but also it is one of the most neglected species so what is it basically it is an ant eater pangolin is an ant eater okay and it has a, a A lot of scales. So basically, two types of pangolin is found in India. That is Indian pangolin and Chinese pangolin. Okay, so Indian pangolin and Chinese pangolin is found in India. And one of the difference between this Indian and Chinese pangolin is there's a terminal scale at the ventral side of the tail. That means at the bottom side of the tail, there is a scale, particular scale that is found only in Indian pangolin. Okay, so that is the difference between Chinese and Indian pangolin. and another interesting factor uh, fact of pangolin is that it has a long long tongue that is long sticky tongue okay which is longer than its body okay so whenever it tries to what eat ants from its uh, uh, the ants uh, hills it it closes sticks its tongue out and what which is longer than takes all the ants it eats okay ants insect whatever it is so it's mainly an ant eater 
Okay, remember this is an anteater. It is what uh, two species are found: Indian pangolin and Chinese pangolin, and the difference between the both. And it has a tongue which is longer than its what uh, body. And what are the conservation issues? Yes, it is Schedule One of the Wildlife Protection Act, nineteen seventy two, and in IUCN it is endangered. Okay, remember it's only endangered, not particularly endangered. Okay, and uh, the major threats that uh, it is facing in India is hunting and poaching, especially for what consumption. Okay, uh, it is a species with high medicinal value, and that is why hunting and poaching is done. And in Southeast Asia, especially countries like China and Vietnam, it is uh, used as uh, as meat, and also its tail has high value. Okay, so it is for uh, it is poached for its meat. And also for what medicinal purposes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and it is one of the most trafficked wildlife species in the world, and there has been what declines from fifty to eighty percent. Okay, so much decline has happened just because of what illegal wildlife trade. Okay, and the source regions that is where it is uh, what the trade starts from is India and Pakistan, and I told you Southeast Asia is the major. Place where it is uh, in high demand, especially China and Myanmar, Vietnam, etc. That becomes the final destination. Okay, so that is uh, about Indian pangolin. Remember, uh, there are two types of pangolins found in India: it's Indian pa pangolin and Chinese pangolin. Okay, and uh, you must also know the difference. And also, its status endangered, just endangered. But also, it is in the Schedule One of the Wildlife Protection Act. Okay, and it is one of the most illegally trafficked species there is decline in population and also uh, what uh, in countries such as uh, the source region is india and pakistan and destination is southeast asian countries where it is used for what mainly as uh, the, its meat is consumed its scale is also traded apart from that it is used for medicinal purposes okay so that is about pangolin now we'll move on to another species that is red sanders okay Uh, it's also called Rakta Jandanam. You, the red sanders is commonly known as Rakta Jandanam in India. Okay. So why is it in news? Yes, again, traffic has uh, what produced a fact sheet about the illegal trade of red sanders. Also, SAI has reported at least twenty-eight incidents of red sander confiscation in Asia. Okay. Uh, it has been a species that is highly being exported from India. So red sanders is called Rakta Jandar. Okay, both traffic and sites has what recorded illegal trafficking of this tree species. Okay, and why is it? From where is it? What actually captured? I mean, uh, it, it is uh, where is the source region of this red sanders? Regions of Andhra Pradesh. Okay, that is Chittur, Kadapa, Nellore, and Kurnool. Okay. These are the major uh, spots where this uh, what red sanders is found, and from here smuggling and illegal logging is what predominant. Okay. Uh, yes, and then again, China. China is the largest import importer of this red sanders or rakta jandar, and apart from that, Hong Kong and Singapore also is what importing a huge amount of what like uh, red sanders. So remember, China is again the destination of red sanders, followed by Hong Kong and Singapore. And uh, this traffic has called for what declaring this region, that is red sanders region, in high conservation areas. Okay, so it is actually an endemic species found only in India. Okay, and traffic has what declared what is uh, I mean asking to declare this region as high conservation areas where this red sanders is found. Okay. So you must know about red sand. So we saw that this is very much threatened species. I mean, illegally trafficked species. So what is this red sanders? Okay, it is actually a tree which is found only in where it is endemic to tropical dry deciduous forest. Remember, it is endemic to where tropical dry deciduous forest. And where is this tri tropical dry deciduous forest found? Yes, it is found in the eastern Ghats region of Andhra Pradesh and also rain shadow region of Western Ghats. So it's not just Andhra Pradesh; it's also found in Karnataka, some parts of Karnataka. So especially the recent uh, dry deciduous regions. Okay, it's also called Yerra Chandanam or Rakta Chandanam. Okay, 
and uh, one of the major problems of illegal trading is it takes a very long time to grow back that is its gestation time that is is a slow growing tree and it achieves its maturity only in 25 to 40 years okay so whenever we cut down a tree it takes uh, around 25 to 40 years for another tree to grow and you know like whenever the people cut down a tree they they never intend to what what planted back so it is very a big problem okay so that is uh, the problem and also one more interesting fact of this red sandus is it is resistant to drought and fire hardy okay so since it is fire hardy it is also used as wood for furniture okay it's very hard wood and it is resistant to drought it's found where in the tropical dry deciduous forest not the deciduous dry deciduous forest okay and it has a it takes a very long time for wood to attain maturity okay and uh, this is one of the reasons this peculiarity is the reason for what it is high demand and uh, its uh, applications okay uh, so yes it is uh, illegally log uh, logged and harvested in many parts okay and it is of high demand both not only in international market but also in the domestic market mainly for its therapeutic properties okay this color red color okay it is used in cosmetics medicinal products and also i told you in furnitures okay in craft etc apart from that it is also used for what coloring agent in textiles and for medicines okay so mainly it's used in cosmetics medicines and also what furnitures and textiles gives a red hue okay so that is why it is high, it is of high demand okay and it is a rare species it is found only in the uh, western uh, eastern ghats regions of uh, the dry deciduous forest regions found the tradition there okay and what is the conservation status yes again this one is also endangered as per iucn red list okay and also it is in the appendix 2 of the sites okay it's endangered as well as it is in the appendix 2 of the sites okay so yes what are the uh, so we know it is highly what uh, it is a high demand it is species of high illegal trade so what did the government do to conserve it yes it actually prohibited the export of red sandals as per what the foreign trade policy okay indian foreign trade policy prohibits the export of red sandals okay then also there is an operation rough jungle okay this was actually launched toward uh, to what break the nexus of illegal trafficking of red sandal and also there is the uh, red sandal anti smuggling task force which was established in 2015 okay these are the few initiatives by the government to what curb the illegal trafficking of uh, red sandal or red uh, sandals okay so yes that is it about red sandals so uh, mainly you must remember what that it is found okay so uh, that is uh, the, the geographical point of view is something which is usually asked for prelims where it is found and uh, the in science and tech point of view you must know its application especially medicinal purpose or uh, what cosmetics etc okay and uh, it is in high demand especially in countries such as what china and south asian countries asian countries east and south east south east asian countries okay so that is it about what red sandals okay so when we spoke about pangolin as well as red sandals one organization we, which we came about was a classic so site was also that site we saw in the last class so this class we will be seeing about traffic so what what is traffic what is its significance okay it is a wildlife trade monitoring network okay so uh, it's actually monitoring the wildlife trade which is happening across countries and it is a a uh, non government organization working on wildlife trade okay and it is a joint program of two the world wildlife fund and iucn so both wwf and iucn has come together to what to monitor the illegal trade of uh, or, sorry monitor the wildlife trade through the uh, organization called traffic okay so it does not what ban the trade in wildlife plants and animals rather it ensures what the trade in wildlife plant and animals is not a threat to what 
its conservation status okay so it just monitors what the trade in wildlife species it does not ban and it just tries to ensure where if the trade in particular species is threat for its conservation okay or is threat is it is threat to its uh, what environment for example pangolin i told you it's it's around 80 to uh, 50 to 80 percent okay illegal trade so whenever the trade illegal i mean trade is so high what happens it becomes what uh what endangered critically endangered or extinct it will be on the verge for extinction verge to extinction okay so this organization just monitors and what identifies which species could be traded on okay and this was established in 1976 okay in order to bring together all the nations okay uh, and also to conserve the species okay both wildlife animals and plants okay uh so you must remember yes illegal wildlife trade is one of the main reasons why uh, many species are becoming endangered for example one horn rhino is was threatened by because of its high demand for its one horn that horn right tigers are becoming what uh, endangered for its it is traded for its skin it is to its tooth etc right so the, the the demand of the wildlife species that is illegal trade which is happening that is why many species are becoming endangered or extinct okay so recently the traffic has launched a wanted life series so what is wanted a life series yes the four big cats in india that is tiger leopard snow leopard and clouded leopard okay this is of high demand in the illegal trade market and this traffic has started a campaign water alive in order to ensure that the trade in these species are not happening okay to create a, a awareness that these are what threatened species i mean endangered species and in order to reduce what the illegal trade happening so there is a wanted alive series so if films influence uh, you basically asking a question uh, what is wanted alive series uh, the organization which is it's a, a wanted alive series uh, campaign is a part of its traffic which and the species is the four big cats that is tiger leopard snow leopard and cloud leopard remember three leopards we is a leopard snow leopard cloud leopard apart from that there is tiger there is no lion or other big cats only these four are there okay what is the life series okay also when we speak about traffic one important organization you must remember is savan there is south asia's wildlife enforcement network okay so this is a uh, organization formed in uh, which uh, of, of all the south asian countries uh, in as a part of traffic so in order to conserve what illegal trafficking in the species in, in the south asia region okay remember south asia wildlife enforcement network which is a part of traffic okay so if you are talking about savan yes this was formed in bhutan okay it is uh, an intergovernmental organization which is established in bhutan okay in 2011 and the main main uh, what would be what the main aim is to what collaborate and cooperate to fight wildlife crime okay remember it is part of traffic savan is part of traffic and it is an organization of south asia countries in order to what fight wildlife crime or illegal trafficking of wildlife species okay so yes that is it about traffic so when we speak about traffic you must remember the organization which is which is part of okay and uh, why is this why is was formed okay in, in order to curb the illegal trafficking of wildlife species it, it, it monitors the species okay it doesn't what ban any trade uh as such but it monitors and ensures that what uh the illegal trading i mean trading of certain species if beyond next it could what damage the environment or uh, it ensures the conservation of nature apart from that you must remember about savan also okay which is a part of what traffic okay so that is it about traffic okay now we we'll speak about project tiger yes this is one of the famous and flagship speak flagship word project of our government project tiger all of you would have heard about this right yes this was an initiative launched in 
yes it is a centrally sponsored scheme of the government that is ministry of environment forest and climate change so you know, what is what does it do centrally sponsored so it gives central assistance that gives money to those states tiger states not to conserve what the tigers okay so they can actually designate tiger reserves okay with the consultation of ndc national tiger conservation authorities states can declare tiger reserves and they'll be funded by the central government okay in order to preserve the tigers okay so it actually works on this tiger reserves actually works on the strategy of core buffer okay so there will be a core area and around that there is a buffer area okay so what is the core buffer actually yes whenever there is a national park or uh, sanctuary wildlife sanctuary that part is considered as core region okay that is a tiger reserve whose whether is national park and sanctuary that that would be the core region and the region around it would be the buffer region so in the buffer region it will be mostly what forested and non forested land which is used for human purposes i mean okay so in the core area it's actually a no go zone okay it's exclusively for what conservation of tiger so we cannot enter to the core area you know, uh, and it is what plant totally for the conservation of tiger and in the buffer area human activities would happen but mostly just collecting of woods or like uh, only for the tribal population okay so uh, it is therefore what the planning of the buffer region is based on inclusive people or interagency okay so people also are also taken into consideration when we plan for the what buffer region so remember tiger uh, reserves up uh, on what strategy this on the core buffer strategy okay so core areas is a no go zone you cannot go there and national parks and sanctuary are, are usually in the uh, core area and this area surrounding that is the buffer region where it is mostly forested and non forested land where you can also see human presence okay so in core area there is exclusive tiger agenda and in the surrounding area the uh, it is a people oriented policy which the tiger reserve is following okay and you know it is uh ntc who declares or who is just in declaring what the uh tiger reserves and you, you we already saw about ntc in the last class it is a statutory body under which act the wildlife protection act of 1970 okay and uh in around 18 states tigers are found okay and uh, there is census carried out uh, with regard to tiger every 4 years and you must also know the highest number of tigers is situated where in the state of madhya pradesh okay so madhya pradesh has the highest number of tiger and the maximum number up, uh, after madhya pradesh there is karnataka and uttarakhand which holds the highest number of tiger. highest number of tiger is in the state of madhya pradesh then we have karnataka and uttarakhand okay so remember ntc is the statutory uh, uh, organization which what oversees the tiger tiger reserves okay and remember it's a state who declares the tiger reserve uh and it is under the wildlife protection act at least eight states have this tiger uh, reserves i mean tiger areas okay and census also carried out uh, apart from that madhya pradesh karnataka uttarakhand okay these are the states with the highest population highest is in madhya pradesh okay so so we are talking about project tiger it is the flag from 1973 it is there okay so why are we trying to conserve tigers yes i have spoken about it when i spoke about what yes cheetah okay so conserving tigers means it is we are trying to conserve all the prey base of the tiger okay all the resulting ecological areas with regard to tigers so remember tiger is a thermal consumer so what does it mean thermal consumer yes sorry yeah thermal consumer means it is one at the top most of the food pyramid okay that means uh, if you are taking the various level trophic levels in the food pyramid the one which is the final consumer is the tiger that means if you are conserving the tiger you can conserve all other species in what the other trophic levels okay so that is why we are focusing on conservation of tiger and what what is the name we call for such conservation it is the umbrella species okay such conservation is called the umbrella 
species conservation so tiger is considered as an umbrella species okay and it is also a flagship species that means it is a phase of the what it is a charismatic species it is a phase of conservation that is phase of the government okay it is a national what national uh, animal this a uh, tiger and that is what is a flagship species it is a high charismatic species okay so remember it is a both flagship and umbrella species okay and remember it is a thermal consumer in the food pyramid that is why we are trying to conserve the uh, tiger okay so whenever we are trying uh, talking about uh, what conservation of tiger one important organization you must be familiar about is the global tiger forum so what is the global tiger forum yes it is an intergovernmental organization it is the only intergovernmental organization actually okay uh, of the willing countries to protect the tigers okay so there are 13 tigerian countries of of which seven are part of this global tiger forum so remember the countries are bangladesh bhutan uh, cambodia india myanmar nepal and vietnam so an easy way to remember is uh remember bbin that is bbin uh, you know the bbin corridor okay remember bbin that means bangladesh bhutan india nepal along with that we have cambodia myanmar and vietnam so bbin plus cambodia myanmar and vietnam okay so these are the countries seven countries in the tiger range uh, which are part of the global tiger forum so remember bbin plus cambodia myanmar and vietnam apart from that what we have uk UK is a non-tiger race country, which is also part of the global tiger forum. So there's a question that uh, the uh, members of the global tiger forum is only from the thirteen tiger race countries. That is actually wrong statement. So you have UK, which is also not a non-tiger race country. Okay. So remember the members. Okay. Then the, uh, so you, the, these are the yeah the thirteen tiger race countries which we spoke of. Okay. in that we have bbi and that bangladesh bhutan nepal and in india and nepal and who yes myanmar uh, cambodian myanmar okay so then there's next organization that is global tiger initiative so uh, when we spoke global tiger initiative launch this another initiative by uh, intergovernmental organization Okay, it is. It was launched in two thousand eight. So it is not just the government bodies which are member of global tiger initiatives. There are other organizations like that is private sector, civil societies, NGOs, etc. Okay, everybody is part of global tiger initiative. And why was it launched? It was launched towards save wild tigers from extinction. Okay, so ah, uh, there is global tiger initiative launched in order to ah uh, what conserve the tigers from extinction. And uh, remember, one more important thing is it's not just the tigers which is conserving; it is also conserving what snow leopards. Okay, in two thousand thirteen, it is it has expanded its what reach to broad broadened its what ambit to snow leopards as well. Okay, so uh, that is a uh, global tiger initiative. Remember, it's not just the governmental or, or governments that is countries which is participating. There are also civil societies, private organizations, etc., which are part of global tiger initiative. Okay. Yes. So now we'll see the ti important tiger reserves which were in use. I mean, the la latest tiger reserves in India. We have Guru Guru Ghasidas National Park and Tamor Pingla Wildlife Sanctuary in Chhattisgarh. So remember Guru Ghasidas and Tamor Pingla Wildlife Sanctuary in Chhatt from Chhattisgarh. Then there is a Ranipur Tiger Reserve in Chhattisgarh district of UP. There is Ramgarh uh, Vishdari uh, Sanctuary from Rajasthan and also. Stevely Puttur Meghmalai Tiger Reserve, Tamil Nadu. So these are the latest editions, and there's one more. Ah, uh, there's Durga Vati. Okay, I forgot to add that Durga Vati Tiger Reserve from Madhya Pradesh. Okay, so these are the ah uh, tiger reserves which ha which has been raised lately announced. The latest announcements. Okay, latest tiger reserves. Okay, so remember Stevely Puttur Meghmalai Tiger Reserve, Ah uh, Ramgarh Vishdari, Ranipur Tiger Reserves, Puri Gasi Das, and Ting Tamor Pingla Wildlife. So that there are around fifty four. What tiger reserves in the country right now? Okay, and these are the latest editions. Okay, and there's one more Gudurgaavati from Madhya Pradesh. Okay, so yes, that is about what Project Tiger Initiative. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, 
about the tiger species. So you must remember about the protect tiger. What are the conservation status of, of, of the tiger? Okay, all the governmental organizations. Okay, the Tiger Forum, etc., and Global Tiger Initiative. Okay, okay. So another thing you must uh, know about this: the Conservation Assured Tiger Standards and the TH2 Awards. Okay, this also has also been in news very lately. So what is CA TS Conservation Assured and Tiger Standards? It's actually a set of award guidelines. Okay, set of what uh, assessment tool. Okay, assessments. So it's actually an accreditation tool for global coalition of tiger range countries. So whenever there's a tiger range country, there's a country, uh, they give a set of what, criteria, minimum standards. Okay. So whenever a national park or tiger reserve is declared, then they try to what, set standards for it to follow. Okay. So if there's a tiger reserve, they must what, uh, if they're trying to ensure the conservation of tiger, they have to award, uh, have these standards. They should meet these standards set by CATS. That is basically CATS. They are actually providing a set of criteria. Okay. If uh, they follow the set of criteria, then uh, they can ensure that the tiger in that particular national park or tiger reserve would be conserved. Okay. So that is CATS. So it's actually an accreditation tool. So it is actually trying to work, monitor how much effective is the tiger conservation. Okay, and it is an initiative of who? Yes, we have the Global Tiger Forum, while a World Wildlife Fund of India. Okay, apart from that, we have NTCA. So along with NTCA, two organizations which are uh, providing uh, CATS is I mean assistance to CATS is Global Tiger Forum and World Wildlife Fund India (WWF India). So NTCA, uh, GTF. Global Tiger Forum and WWF India are part of what conservation issue tiger standards. Okay, so remember it is a set of standards. Okay, which is uh, what which has to be achieved by the tiger reserves in order to what ensure that the, the tigers in their park is conserved. Okay, so that is CATS. And uh, yes, recently 14 tiger reserves have been given accreditation by who? This CATS. So in the northeast, there is Assam region. We have Manas, Kashiranga, and Orang. So you can see Manas is here, Kashiranga is somewhere here, and Orang is here down. Okay. So this identify these locations where this tiger reserve is found because UPC has this tendency of like uh, which state it is asking which state the tiger reserve is or the location or arranging the tiger reserve from north to south, east to west, etc. Okay, so we have Manas here, uh, Kaziranga here, and Aura. So that is from Assam, which it, uh, has got accreditation. From Central India, we have both ma from the state of Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra. So we have Satpura, Kanha, and Panna from Madhya Pradesh. So here's Panna, Satpura is here. Okay, Satpura is here, and Panha is down here. Okay, and in uh, Maharashtra, we have Tenj. So it's actually Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh border. In Central India, then from Bihar, North India, Valmiki Tiger Reserve. So this is the only tiger reserve in where Bihar, Valmiki Tiger Reserve. Okay, and from UP we have Dudua. Okay, so we have Valmiki here from Bihar and Dudua from UP. Okay, Central India we have who? Satpura, Panna, Kanha, and Maharashtra Penj. Okay, uh, from uh, Assam we have Manas, Kaziranga, and Oran. Manas, Kaziranga, Oran. Okay. And now from South India, uh, sorry, from West Bengal, we have Sundarbans. Okay. West Bengal, Sundarbans. And South India, from Kerala, we have Parambikulam. Uh, from Karnataka, we have Bandipur. So Bandipur, you can see here. Parambikulam is here. And from Tamil Nadu, we have Anna, Anna Malay and oh, Mudumalay. Okay. So these are the Mudumalay. Okay. So these are the what tiger reserve which have which has been awarded CATS conservation status. Okay, accredited. Okay. So uh, remember Manas, Kaziranga, Orang. Uh, so even if you don't know about uh, the CATS or remember about this, remember these tiger reserve their location. Okay. So whenever any tiger reserve is in use, UPC has a tendency to ask about it. Okay. 
सो ये वाल्मीकि टाइगर रिजर्व ऑफ बिहार दुदवा ऑफ यूपी सुंदरबन इन वेस्ट बंगाल सेंट्रल इंडिया ऑफ सतपुरा कन्हा एंड पन्ना फ्रॉम मध्य प्रदेश पेंजन महाराष्ट्र अरंबिकुलम बंदीपुर एंड मुदमले एंड अनमले फ्रॉम साउथ ओके सो दिस हैव बीन गिवन वर्ड टू सी ए टी एस फैक्स ओके ओके सो नेक्स्ट इंपॉर्टेंट वन इज द टी एक्स टू अवॉर्ड वॉट इज टी एक्स टू द नेम यू कैन सी द नेम यू कैन टी इंटू टू सो वेन एवर द टाइगर पॉपुलेशन इज डबल टी इंटू टू ओके टी एक्स टू सो वेन एवर इट इज डबल दिस अवॉर्ड विल बी गिवन ओके सो बेसिकली टू एक्नोलेज वॉट द एफर्ट्स ऑफ द स्टेट गवर्नमेंट ओके uh and the local communities which are trying to conserve the tigers so whenever a new tiger is uh, reserve is declared okay and if the population of that tiger reserve is doubled okay so whenever it is doubled this award be given tx2 award is given and who would be giving it as yes, of course cats is there there are so many organizations that has come together to to award to award this one among them is cats then we have the global Tiger Forum. Then you have I I U C N's Tiger Habitat Conservation Program, Panthera, U N D P, etc. Okay, W W. Okay, so you you need not remember all the names. Remember C A T is there is there uh, Global Tiger Forum is there I U C N's uh, Integrated Tiger Habitat Conservation Program is there U N D P is there uh, W W F is there. Okay, remember. Just remember there are so many organizations which has come together to award what T X two awards. Okay, and also why is it given? when the population of tigers doubles okay at a particular new tiger reserve so recently the satyamangalam tiger reserve in tamil nadu has been awarded this tx2 award okay this is because the tiger population has doubled to 80 okay so tx2 award you must remember this given whenever the tiger uh, population is doubled okay and recently satyamangalam tiger reserve of tamil nadu is has been given apart from that there's one national park from uh, nepal but that is bardia national park which is all, which has also been awarded this tx2 awards okay yes so that is about tx2 awards so yes i told you who was awarded the tx2 awards it is the satyamangalam tiger reserve okay so we we must see what something about the satyamangalam tiger reserve right Yes, it was declared a tiger reserve in twenty thirty. One most important point is it is a link between western and eastern Ghats. Okay, the Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve. So there is western Ghats here, there is eastern Ghats now. This point is where we have the Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve. Okay, this is a link between Nilgiris and eastern Ghats. Okay, and remember Nilgiris has one of the highest population of what the tigers. Now this telling about a particular state, the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. Okay, and uh, yes, uh, this Satyamangalam has connection to other tiger reserves such as Mudumalai, Bandipur, etc. So basically, all the tiger reserves in Western Ghats and Eastern Ghats is connected to what the Satyamangalam tiger is. And this was actually asked for prelims as well, Satyamangalam tiger reserve, which is uh, it connects both both Western and Eastern Ghats. So there are even prelims. Okay, so uh, remember this in Tamil Nadu, it is uh, here like where Western Ghats and Eastern Ghats meet. Okay, that is Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve. Okay, so that is it about tigers. So we still spoke about what ah uh, the Project Tiger Initiative, right? Then also about what yes ah uh, the C A T S and ah uh, what ah uh, the T T X two awards. Apart from that, what did we talk about? Yes, ah uh, the Global Tiger Pro Forum and the Global Tiger Initiative. Remember, Global Tiger Forum is has seven members uh, from the thirteen tiger range countries. Apart from that, we have UK also as the member, right? Then what do, what did we talk about? We also spoke about the Global Tiger Initiative, which is which has not just the government but also civil societies and other organization. It is not just tiger; it is trying to conserve. It also conserve who the small leopard, right? And whenever tiger reserve is declared, we have who. uh yes the ntca the state government is uh, declaring tiger is on the recommendation of ntca and also it works on the strategy of the core buffer strategy okay so in the core area we have national parks and sanctuaries where 
the planning is done exclusively for tigers and it is a no go zone okay you cannot go there okay and uh, on the buffer area that is the area surrounding the core we have what the uh, yes in forested and non forested area where uh, planning is done for what Al along with tiger is also done for people uh, in that area there is a people oriented policy in that buffer zone okay so remember the latest tx2 uh, award is given to which which one satyamangala tigers okay and also remember all the other accredited uh, tiger reserves by uh, the uh, what uh, the, uh, the cats awards okay so yes that is it about the tiger now we'll see about the kelp forest this is also one area which uh, you guys have already asked for films kelp forest so what are these kelp forest okay, it's actually underwater ecosystem okay so recently there has been study that this kelp forest has been declining especially due to climate change so this is one of the uh, what species that is highly impacted by what climate change okay so it is actually underwater ecosystem and it is also found where in shallow waters okay it is found near coastlines or uh, yeah okay in the continental shelf region okay so it's actually a large brown algae okay so remember it, it cannot live in deep waters it has to live in shallow waters mainly why yes it has to grow up okay it has to grow up to the surface in order to what what attach it to the what it has, it has to get what sunlight okay so it, there are two conditions for it to grow on the bottom there should be sea floor on the top there should be what sunlight so it can grow only where near the shore where the water level is very low that is continental shelf region okay and remember it is a blue green sorry uh, brown algae large brown algae okay it is underwater ecosystem also it needs what clear water okay so it is near the coastal area it uh, grows and the water should be shallow and also there should be clear water okay so one term which we call for kelp forest is what the foundation species another example for foundation species is what the coral reefs right so why is kelp called the foundation species yes a lot of other species are dependent on it okay so that means uh, there are so many fish or other algae or other like diatoms etc which are dependent on what on this kelp forest okay so it actually gives a ha habitat to so many other species okay invertebrate fish algae etc okay so that is kelp forest so you can see the picture here so you would have seen this like yeah so that on top there is sunlight so on the bottom it is attached to what the ground on the sea ground so this is actually a kelp forest and whenever there is a uh, kelp forest or you would have seen this in this in the movie right uh, what what is it mean avatar avatar waters if you would have seen these plants okay so uh, yeah uh, so it is found near the shore remember coast near the coast okay and it needs what clear water and also it needs sunlight okay so it is mainly found in the continental shelf region okay so why is it significant so we spoke about continental uh, what uh, kelp forest so much so there should be some importance right yes i told you it is a foundation species that means it is a food source for variety of marine creatures okay A lot of fish, invertebrates, etc., depend on this kelp forest. Okay, and also it has a lot of what uh, it, the nooks and crannies. That is, the, so many regions where uh, fish can reside, like it can uh, like hide out or something like that. It can live there. Okay, uh, it can create a home there. So it has a habitat. It is a habitat for so many species. Okay, apart from that, it. acts as a shelter for coastline so whenever there is cyclone or storms okay when if there is kelp forest near the shore it acts as a shelter okay it actually reduces the impact of what the storms and uh, another big big thing is that it, it actually what takes in carbon high it sequesters carbon it acts as a carbon sink right 
ocean is one of the greatest absorbers of what the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and that is why ocean acidification has happened and if there's kelp for forest what happens takes up much of the carbon okay so it acts as a carbon sink remember it is a important food source that is it is a foundation species it has it is a what gives a lot of food for so many species which are what in sync with uh, in living in, in the uh, kelp forest it gives a habitat for so many species and also it shelters coastline from storms and also sequesters what carbon okay that is kelp forest remember it's a brown algae it needs shallow waters okay it has to rise up to the uh, surface right uh needs sunlight okay and it also needs clean water that is it about uh, what kelp forest now an important national park we'll be seeing is the kaziranga national park okay so whenever you hear the name kaziranga you must remember what which species yes the one horned rhino and where is this kaziranga located it is in assam so remember whenever he, you hear the name kaziranga you must remember who thinks it is in assam and it is in where it is important for one horned rhino okay okay now we'll see what is kaziranga national park about kaziranga national park okay remember it is at the edge of the eastern himalayan biodiversity hotspot that is yeah in assam district of nagpur golaghat and nagaon districts okay and remember brahmaputra is passing through this park and it lies in the north of this kaziranga national park okay so kaziranga national park is there on the north we have what brahmaputra and the south we have Kar karbi anglong hills okay remember karbi anglong hills is in the south of Na kaziranga on, and on top we have what on top we have brahmaputra so brahmaputra is flowing like this then we have the kaziranga national park and on the bottom we have what the karbi anglong hills okay and remember it is also unesco world heritage site and the tiger reserve okay so uh, kaziranga is a tiger reserve as well apart from that we have the biggest population of one horned rhinos here okay uh, so we have i already told brahmaputra is flowing through this uh, national park apart from that we have the tributaries of uh, brahmaputra that is diplomora diplomora dansiri etc they are also flowing through this national park. okay and remember uh this is one region which, which has high uh, which uh, frequently has uh, receives high rainfall and that is why we have tropical moist broadleaf forest then this tropical rainforest is found here okay so the uh, so one thing you must remember uh, is brahmaputra is flowing through this part and uh, that is why one of the biggest threats of what one horn rain okay so you know every year brahmaputra is facing frequent floods okay so whenever there is flood in uh, this brahmaputra major part of this kasiranga goes under water so what happens if kasiranga goes under water yes all the one horned rhino would die right so that is how many of the one horned rhino is dying okay okay so you can see here the location of kasiranga it's here right so i told brahmaputra is passing here we have what uh, this uh, karbi anglong hills here below this okay uh, we can also see the important other important national parks in uh, assam that we have nameri here orang manas dihing patkai dibru saikova etc okay and raimona yeah so the latest two editions of national park is raimona and uh, dihing patkai okay these are the two national parks Uh, which has been re recently introduced. Also, remember Nameri. Nameri it has continuity where in uh, Arunachal Pradesh has Pakke, Pakui, Pakke or Pakui National Park. It's called both. Okay, so Pakke was actually asked for films. Okay, so remember Nameri has continuity up to Arunachal Pradesh, which is called Pakke National Park or Pakui National Park. Okay, so uh, remember the location of Kaziranga, Manas, or Ram etc. Okay, the Bruce Lake was on top. So, and the the Bruce Lake was is near where the National Water National Waterway Two is from, the Bruce the Bruce Gar to Dubri. Okay, so this is near that the origin of the National Waterway. Okay. Okay, so yeah, that is Kaziranga. So whenever we speak about Kaziranga, we must also speak about what? Yes, the Great One Horn Rhino. That is the Indian Rhino. 
okay so only this species is found in india so the only rhino species found in india is the great one horn rhino it is also called the indian rhino this is the largest of rhino species and uh, the most important feature of it is the single black horn okay it just have one horn okay and apart from that there's a gray brown hide within the skin folds okay that means there's layers like that okay and also it is a grazing species it's a vegetarian species so it needs what grassland okay so that is why it is found in the banks of what the brahmaputra okay uh, although yes this one horn rhino is always in news or like discussing uh, it is threatened species it, according to iu seen its status is just vulnerable okay so remember it is not a critically endangered species its status is just vulnerable okay and it is also in appendix 1 of sites and schedule 1 of wildlife protection act okay so that is great uh, one horn rhino remember its status is just vulnerable it needs vast grasslands that means it is a grazing species okay and uh, remember its peculiarity and it is the only rhino species found in india okay so when we as we speak about one horn rhino we must also remember the program for its conservation that is rhino vision 2020 So it's already over in twenty twenty, but we'll just look into what it is. Okay, it is a flagship program to conserve this rhino. It started in two thousand twenty two thousand five. Okay, and the aim was to what create a population of at least three thousand species. Okay, in Assam by the year twenty twenty. So for that, uh, they were trying to relocate or translocate the uh, thick populated Kaziranga and Babitara. They 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 taking rhino from the Kasaranga and placing into other national parks such as Orang Manas, Buri, uh, Bura Chapori, Dibru Saikova, etc. Okay, so um, yes, they were trying to translocate the uh, rhinos from where the highly populated Kasaranga national park. Okay, and uh, who started this? Yes, obviously Assam government who did be there. Assam Forest Department is there. then there is international rhino foundation then there is why uh, wwf india okay and apart from that there is also borderland territorial council okay so uh, indian rhino vision and remember this is one of the most successful programs so by 2020 we could actually what uh, the population actually increased for, for around 2900 or something that is around 3000 okay and remember uh, but the only problem was that all that there were seven national Parks which were intended to what uh, translocate the rhinos only four had what only four had this rhino species okay it was successful only in four okay and Manas National Park regained its national world heritage status in 2011 just because of this program okay and also uh, there has been decline in poaching in the years 2018 and 19 of one horn rhinos. So uh, that is it about one horn rhino. So uh, whenever we speak about what Kaziranga National Park, remember it is in Assam. Okay, it is a uh, one place where we can find one horn rhino. It is also a tiger reserve. Okay, and yes, uh, apart from that, uh, we also saw the location of Kaziranga National Park. Okay, then we spoke about one horn rhinos. So one horn rhino, why is it famous? Yes, it is known for its one horn. Which has uh, and yeah, uh, I forgot that it, it is actually what the threat was. It is highly what poached. One threat was the flooding of uh, Brahmaputra. Another threat was high poaching. It was poached for its one horn, which has what it is, which is what uh, it has. It was known for its aphrodisiac properties. Okay, and it has high medicinal value. So that is why it was poached. Okay, and yes, ah. Uh, There is a India. There was an India. Ah, uh, what Rhino Vision Program? Okay. Ah, uh, Rhino Vision Program. It was ah. Uh, its target was to what increase the population up to three thousand rhinos by the year twenty twenty, and it is one of the most successful program. Okay. We are actually achieved three thousand rhinos by translocating to other national parks in and around where Assam. Okay. Ah, uh, yes, and ah uh, Manas National Park also we saw. Yes, so that is it about Kasiranga and the rhinos. Okay, remember it's uh, rhinos while uh, what are you saying that it is vulnerable? Okay, don't forget that. Okay, okay. Now we'll see about the eco-sensitive zones. 
So what are the eco-sensitive zones? Yes, this was also very much in news. Okay, last uh yeah, last year especially, because there was Supreme Court verdict. Actually, based on this, there was also mains question last year. Okay. So uh yes, why is it significant? Yes, Supreme Court has declared that at least one kilometer around every protected forest, that is every national park and wildlife sanctuary should be what declared as eco-sensitive zone. Well. Okay, so Supreme Court has what mandatorily confirmed, I mean, mandatorily asked to what preserve every, declare every region at least one kilometer around what national parks and wildlife sanctuaries as what eco-sensitive zone. Okay, at least one kilometer. Okay, and uh, like it's not like what is exi already existing. If there is like ten kilometers around uh, national park, which is already existing as a person, it it should need not be reduced to one. That is not the case. Which though all those national parks and wildlife sanctuaries does not have an what a area of at least one kilometers should declare at least one kilometer. Okay, already existing ones could should not be changed. Okay, so that was the verdict of the Supreme Court. Okay, so we'll see what eco sensitive zones are. Okay. So yes, we know it's actually a buffer zone. Uh, around national parks and wildlife sanctuaries, what is the problem? Yes, there'll be a lot of species inside the national parks and wildlife sanctuaries, right? They try to come out. They just walk out of the national park. So whenever they walk out, there should be a buffer zone up to which they can go. Right. So that they there, there is no man animal conflict. Okay, so if there is somebody in the buffer zone, what happens? Yes, there's high probability that either they'll try to kill the species or what happens? The species, that is, there's a tiger or there's a leopard, they try to kill human beings. So there's high chance of conflict. So any region around this national park should be declared as what it was sensitive. Zone. So it's actually ecological fragile areas around this national parks or wider centuries. Okay, protected areas. And it is notified by who? The MOEFCC. Okay. This acts as a shock absorber. Okay. Yes. And here. Yeah. Uh, so I told you as a transition region. So whenever there is highly populated species within the core area, it acts as a shock absorber so that what the, there is a transition from this core to the regions where human habitat. Okay. So it's a transition zone. And remember, it is not mentioned in the Environmental Protection Act. Okay, this term, eco-sensitive zone, is not mentioned under in the Act. Okay. So uh, earlier, it was said that it can go up to 10 kilometers. Eco-sensitive zones can be declared uh, up to at least 10 kilometers uh, according to Wildlife Conservation Strategy 2002. So now, uh, Supreme Court has asked to declare at least one kilometer, but earlier it was like at least 10 kilometers could be declared. It can go up to, and if it is like highly sensitive area, that is where there is high uh, what, uh, population of uh, endangered species, then it can go beyond 10 kilometers. Okay. So remember, it is the fragile area around the national parks or wildlife sanctuaries. Okay. That is declared as eco sensitive zone. Okay. Clear. So that is eco sensitive zone. So it it can range up to 10 kilometers and beyond if it is highly sensitive region. Okay. And remember, this Environmental Protection Act does not have the term eco sensitive zone. Okay. And it acts as a shock absorber. Okay. So that is eco sensitive zone. And now we'll see. Yeah, a few of the important eco sensitive zone declared. So we have uh, Sultanpur National Bird Sanctuary, Haryana. Okla Bird Sanctuary, Noida, Sundarbans, there is uh, what eco sensitive zone, Western Ghats, that is one of the most important regions which has eco sensitive zones. Yes, then there's Karnala Bird Sanctuary, not Haryana, it's actually Maharashtra, okay, that's a typo. Okay, it's my, uh, Maharashtra. Then around Bandikur National Park and Tiger Reserve, there's eco sensitive zone, that is also part of what Western Ghats region. Okay, then there is Pulikat Bird Sanctuary, uh, which is actually in the bordering. Uh, in between Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. Okay. Uh, it's actually spread in both regions. It's around here. Okay. 
so these are the few ecological sensitive zones okay clear yeah. okay so and also two organization you must know about whenever we speak about ecological sensitive zone is i mean non organization the reports the committees okay there was a madhav madhav gadri committee and kasturi ranga committee so these two committees are very important whenever we speak about world eco sensitive zones so uh madhav gadri committee was initially formed towards study the uh, region which has to be declared as eco sensitive zone in the west western ghats region okay so madhav gadri committee was formed constituted mainly what to declare the eco sensitive regions of uh, western ghats region okay so uh, uh, this committee actually recommended that at least 64% of the western ghats region almost whole of the western ghats okay majority part should be declared as what eco sensitive zone but what was the problem if so much area is declared obviously all the people residing there would protest that means the government started protesting especially government of kerala karnataka etc because this region west sadgat region is not just uh the species that reside there there are also known for its plantation okay plantation agriculture is known in this region west sadgat region especially in kerala and karnataka we have coffee plantation we have rubber plantation etc okay so all the people who are dependent on these cultivation started protesting and what inherently the government also started protesting okay to reduce this percentage they cannot de declare and also like there are so many people who are also habitating in what the uh, western ghats region so another committee was formed in order to what look into this madhav gadri committee that is kasturi rangan committee was formed okay so what are the kasturi rangan committee saying yes this person madhav gadri told at least 64% of the region this person kasturi rangan told what No, so much area should not be declared. It can reduce it to thirty-seven. Only thirty-seven percent need to be declared. Okay, so uh, that will cover at least one twenty-three revenue villages. Okay, but remember, both these committees has not yet been what as uh, followed. That is, not even thirty-seven percent has been declared as eco-sensitive zone as per as of now. Okay. and this was mainly in news especially when uh, the floods happened like uh, there was frequent landslides and floods in kerala in karnataka region okay so when uh, this happened uh, like in the last few years this committee uh, reports again was in news okay so whenever we speak about eco sensitive zones in the western ghats region two reports you must remember is madhav gadri committee report and the kasturi nagar committee report Okay, even if this is not as per plans, you can use these for what means. Okay, so that is it about what eco sensitive zones. Okay, so recently remember there was a Supreme Court verdict that at least one kilometers around all protected areas, that is national parks and wildlife sanctuary, should be declared as what eco sensitive zones. Clear? Okay. Now we'll move on to the next topic, that is biodiversity heritage sites. this was also in news okay so what is biodiversity heritage sites yeah the name itself suggests right yes it is a highly ecologically fragile ecosystems that is it is high biodiversity okay and it is also heritage site also it's a combination okay and it is declared as a part of section 37 of biological diversity act and it is not notified by who the state government So biodiversity heritage site is declared by the state government, okay, under the bio bio biological diversity act, two thousand two. And what are the restrictions? It, it says actually there are no restrictions. Okay, uh, the biological diversity heritage sites has no restrictions until and unless the local community says that this restriction has to be given. So basically, it ha it tries to enhance the quality of life of the. local people so basically give, it's given awareness to the people there and are then to conserve the heritage site okay so unless the local community demands conservation or uh, prohibition of certain activities there is no certain restrictions in the bio biodiversity heritage site okay remember it is part of the biological diversity act and the state government is somebody who notifies what the biodiversity heritage site okay okay so why is it in use 
yes uh, recently uh, what aritapati on madurai district has been declared what biodiversity heritage site remember it is what a site in tamil nadu aritapati in madurai tamil nadu okay and also the first biodiversity heritage site is the nallur tamarind grove in bangalore karnataka okay that was the first biodiversity heritage site so like, and now the latest one is aritapati okay and uh, it is tamil nadu's first biodiversity heritage site and uh, 35th in the country okay aritapati so we'll see about this aritapati biodiversity heritage site yes so as the name it has it has what both both ecological and historical significance okay so uh, what is the ecological significance it has lot of species of birds such as la lagar falcon shaheen falcon bonelli eagles etc so many species of birds and also reptile species and other uh, what fauna species such as indian pangolin sender loris pythons etc okay so many species are there so it's ecologically significant as well as it is historically significant because that is a lake anaconda lake okay this was cons- constructed during the pandian kings in the 16th century okay so anaconda lake is significant okay apart from that there are so many megalithic structures rock temples brahmi inscriptions jain beds etc in the region okay so it has both ecological significance as well as what biodiversity uh, i mean sorry her- historical significance that means there are lots of what uh, species which is uh, uh, what a rare species in this region apart from that historical uh, significance in- include the anaconda lake of the pandian kings and also megalithic structures such as uh, any other uh, historical structures such as, such as rock temples brahmi inscriptions jain beds etc so that is aritapati biodiversity at its site where is it madurai tamil nadu okay and other uh, latest additions to biodiversity heritage sites just uh, remember the names and the location okay you, you must you need not look into the most of the details of it just remember the names there is a debbari chabimura and tripura two sites in tripura okay debbari chabimura or uh, and petling ship and its surrounding both of them are from tripura then two from assam also hajong tatois lake and borjuli wild rice site okay hajong the uh, the na- names are this right na- hajong tatois lake in assam you might think it is tripura but it is assam okay then borjuli wild rice site in assam then amarkantak amarkantak is also important in madhya pradesh okay amarkantak is also a what biosphere reserve okay achin kamar amarkantak Okay, it's part of a biosphere. So remember, uh, Tripura, two sites, Debari or Sabimura and Bethlingship, Assam, we have Ajong Tortoise Lake and Burjuli Wild Rice site and also Amar Kantak in Madhya Pradesh. These were the late, are the latest addition to what the biodiversity health and science. Okay, so that is biodiversity health and science. So we spoke about the Biological Diversity Act. Okay. by which this biodiversity heritage sites is declared so we we'll see the biological diversity act now okay so what is the biological diversity act yes it was enacted in 2002 why was it enacted yes we spoke about the convention of biodiversity when did we speak about the convention of biodiversity yes last class we saw right it was an outcome of what the rio earth summit right one of the three organization which was formed during the rio earth summit was the convention of Bio- biodiversity okay so uh, this in order to enact the uh, what provisions of the convention this biological diversity act was passed in 2002 and also the biological diversity rules was notified in 2004 okay and uh, why would it be then yes in order to conserve the biodiversity and also the associated knowledge that means you cannot share this knowledge with foreign individuals except on certain conditions specified by this act okay and it works on a three tier system and also checks biopiracy so what is biopiracy that means uh, whenever some other country or somebody else uses the knowledge that is traditional knowledge or biological knowledge or resources from our country and claims it's theirs 
that is called biopiracy for example like tam uh, this uh, what turmeric turmeric uh, so you guys actually claim the patent of turmeric the medicinal properties of turmeric but we know it is very common in india to use uh, turmeric as for medicinal purpose right so such such acts are called bi biopiracy so in order to check biopiracy this act has provisions okay and apart from that it acts on a three tier system so we have a national biodiversity authority at the top and the national level then we have the state biodiversity boards then we also have the biodiversity management committee so it works in a three tier system okay that is a biological diversity act so i already told it it is what it aims at what to enact it tries to enact the provisions of what cbd convention on biodiversity so what would be its objectives will be similar to what the cbd so its main objective is to conserve the biodiversity sustainable use of its components and also fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising out of its utilization of the generative resources okay so these are the main objectives so you must learn this in by heart it will be useful for both limbs as well as means so you must remember its conservation of biodiversity sustainable use of its components fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising out of the utilization of genetics clear so these are the main objectives of our biological diversity act 2002 okay so yes uh we spoke about the objective so why why is it important this year's prelims for this year's prelim yes recently the government has introduced a new bill okay the biological diversity amendment bill 2021 so we need not look into the major provisions of it but remember there is a new bill uh, which is uh, not yet let pass but it is in the final stages of consultation by joint, joint parliament committee okay so that is why this act is important okay so yes that is about biological diversity act so remember it it is its main aim is to what conserve the biodiversity and also what uh, protect the traditional knowledge check the biopiracy etc and also it works in a three tier system okay uh, then also the major objectives uh, so basically it was what enacted to uh, what uh, provide for the provisions of what uh, legislation for provisions of the convention of biodiversity and its objectives are conservation of biodiversity sustainable use of its components and also what uh, the fair and equitable sharing of what the benefits arising of genetic resources okay utilization of the genetic resources and yes uh, recently there is a proposed amendment to the act okay okay so now we move on to the next topic that is national action plan for the wildlife conservation okay so this is a new initiative uh, for the year for the time span of 2020 to 2025 okay so yes national action plan for wildlife conservation so why is it there obviously for the conservation of wildlife so it is it is trying to establish wildlife conservation breeding centers in states such as up tripura maharashtra karnataka and tamil nadu okay so we have up in the north tripura in the uh, south uh, sorry east northeast and uh, from the southern, southern we have karnataka and tamil nadu central there is maharashtra okay up tripura maharashtra karnataka and tamil nadu okay then what are the key provisions of this initiative yes it is trying to what conserve uh, uh, what it will uh, be for a conservation breeding program for red headed vulture and egyptian vulture there will be a conservation breeding program and apart from that there will be at least vulture safe zones in every state okay so vulture is one of the most threatened species there are at least four critically endangered vulture species in india you we'll see that so there will be vulture safe zone in every state okay and also this way there will be conservation breeding program for red headed vulture and egyptian vulture okay there are also four rescue centers okay which is uh, between which would be established in each geographical area like for example in north india we have kunjor in haryana okay uh, central india there is gopal northeast guwahati in assam and south there is hyderabad so these four and four region there will be rescue centers vulture rescue centers okay remember vulture safe zone in every state and vulture 
the four vulture or rescue centers pinjor in north india bhopal in central india guwahati in northeast and hyderabad in the south okay so uh, and also there is conservation breeding program for red hearted vulture and egyptian vulture okay so these are the key provision and also one of the major provision is it prohibits the veterinary use of a drug that is found toxic so which drug is it which is the most what fatal drug for this vulture there is a drug called diclofenac okay so this is the biggest prob problem that vultures has faced so whenever there is a carcasses like it's not just uh, like the vulture does not get this medicine directly so whenever there is uh, some disease for this program i mean so uh, some animal it will be treated with what diclofenac and we know vultures is what a scavenger species right it it eats the carcasses that is whenever the species die out it eats them right so whenever uh, this uh, vulture eats the carcasses of any species with this diclofenac drug it creates bioaccumulation that is uh, the 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 diclofenac gets accumulated in the body of also and finally it results in renal failure that is how many most of the vulture species has died in the recent past okay so this veterinary drugs or uh, uses actually prohibited okay and also this uh, in vulture safe zones what 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 are they trying to do they are going to feed this vultures free of this drug okay so it's actually vulture restaurants would be there like that not, not the vulture they are not going to feed i mean vulture restaurants means the place where vultures could come and eat the, just remember like that okay okay so yes we spoke about this uh, conservation in a shade of vulture so we we'll say what why this vultures are important okay it is uh, actually found in tropics and subtropics okay it is usually called the nature's garbage collectors okay why is it called the nature's garbage collector yes it is a scavenger scavenger species it cleans the environment that means it eats all the dead species whenever a species die who feeds on it the vulture species feeds on it so it is called nature's or garbage collector or it is like scavenger species okay and india is home to nine species of vulture there is oriental white black vulture long bill vulture slender bill vulture himalayan vulture red headed egyptian bearded cinereus and eurasian griffon so you you need not remember all these names okay remember there are nine species of vulture of which four are critically endangered so just remember these four names okay which are these four critically endangered species of vulture so there is oriental white black slender billed long billed and red headed these four are the critically endangered vultures found in india okay there is oriental white back slender billed long billed and red headed okay remember remember the characteristics so it will be easy to remember so there is oriental white back slender bill long bill and red headed okay these are the critically endangered vulture species so remember these names okay apart from that there is also egyptian vulture which is also endangered so just remember these names uh, you need not remember all the nine species okay and remember why is why should we conserve it yes these four are critically endangered other species are all also threatened okay and if if they are not there what will happen yes the environment uh the it would uh, what there be nobody to eat the carcasses or there be no scavengers okay so uh, they are actually nature's uh, garbage collectors and it is found mainly in the tropics and subtropics okay so yes that is it about uh, vultures so remember the critically endangered species of vultures and the initiative by the government to conserve vultures okay and where and all it is uh, where they are creating uh, like every state there should be vulture safe zone and also what vulture uh, what rescue centers north south etc pinjor etc pinjor hai to but okay 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 now another important thing which is in news is valmiki tiger reserve so i spoke about valmiki tiger reserve earlier where was it yes it was in bihar This is the only tiger reserve in Bihar. Okay, remember Valmiki Tiger Reserve. Okay, and why was it in the news? 
yes this valmiki tiger is a was in use mainly because uh what it has recently established a elephant rescue center okay so whenever an ele elephant is uh, uh what stray or abandoned or injured there is a elephant rescue center which tries to rehabilitate it okay and it is established in bihar's valmiki tigers and also re, uh, there has been high migration of what rhinos okay uh from the neighboring nepal which to chitwan national park from the nepal so in, in order to increase this rhino bearing areas okay in uh, west champaran district okay this uh, the government has taken initiative in wild valmiki tigers okay so i told you valmiki tiger reserve was the only national park in bihar right uh, sorry oh, only tiger reserve in bihar okay and remember it is in the easternmost limit of india's himalayan terai forest so what is terai forest okay yes, terai forest are those marshlands okay it is located in the foothills of shivaliks himalayas okay and uh, whenever we speak about uh, terai we must also know about babar that is babar is there then if we take from um, what, mountains to the ganges the soil distribution or the terrain distribution that is there is babar then we have terai then we have bangar and khadar bangar and khadar are basically the soil types right for fine grain soil is or khadar then a bit more coarse grain is or bangar then we have the charai which is marshland and then we have the boulders which is babar okay so uh, this is how the location is well, up to the ganges is there uh, okay so uh, yes the rai forest this valmiki tiger reserve was part of the therai region okay it was initially a uh, wildlife sanctuary designated in 1978 then became a national park in 1990 okay uh, one important thing is it is at the border india border that is it borders with nepal's chitwan national park okay i already told that they are trying to increase the rhino bearing areas mainly because the rhinos are migrating from where this nepal okay uh, so it it has two rivers passing through it is gandak and masan gandak is in the west side of the park so there is uh, nepal here there is an uh, valmiki tiger reserve and on the west side there is what gandak gandak passing okay then uh, yes apart from 100 there is also indian bison which frequently migrate to this valmiki national park okay from chitwan from national nepal remember it is at the border okay uh, so you can see the picture here so you we have the nepal here this is the international border then we have this core area of this valmiki tiger reserve then this is a what buffer area then this is the gandak river which is passing okay on the west side okay so this is the valmiki tiger reserve so remember it is the only tiger reserve in where bihar and it is at the indo nepal border okay we have also gandak river passing through okay so that is what uh, yes uh, valmiki tiger ne next important tiger reserve is the durgavati tiger reserve why is it important yes it is the a new tiger reserve in the state of madhya pradesh it was declared by madhya pradesh wildlife board recently why was it declared yes there is a ken betwa interlinking project okay so what will happen if ken betwa interlinking projects come into existence at least three fourth of the panna tiger reserve would go under the waters okay so if panna tiger reserve goes under water what happens the tigers will obviously migrate so where will it migrate to yes other places of what uh, this madhya pradesh as well as neighboring up so the uh, nta is ntc this my national tiger conservation authority what asked durgavati uh, what, both madhya pradesh and up government to establish what uh, this tiger reserve in the adjoining areas of what panna tiger reserve so that is why madhya pradesh has recently declared what the durgavati tiger reserve okay and how would be the tiger shifted not be like taken and put there they are actually trying to create a green corridor that means the tiger would automatically what migrate it walk through the green corridor and move to where the durgavati tiger reserve from the tapana tiger reserve okay and yes i told you ntc has asked both up up and madhya pradesh government uh, to notify tiger reserve in order to manage about uh, wildlife in the panna tiger reserve and uh, up has already declared ranipur wildlife sanctuary actually uh, 
there are so many tigers which are frequenting up kanpur wildlife sanctuary so up has thought that chalo uh, we will declare declare uh, ranipur wildlife sanctuary as tiger reserve in order to accommodate the tigers from the panna tiger reserve okay so we have the panna tiger reserve which will be sunk when yes then betwa interlinking project would be completed and the tigers from there would be relocated two locations one is ranipur wildlife sanctuary from in up and another one is dogar durgavati tiger reserve what mp here yeah. so that is durgavati tiger reserve is one of the newest tiger reserve declared by the uh, government okay so we will also just look into what ken betwa interlinking project is yes it is one of the first river interlinking project which is proposed to be implemented by the government okay and why is it what uh, done yes it 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 will it will help to what meet the irrigation needs of at least 9 lakh hectares of farmland it will ensure drinking water to at least 62 lakh people it has both the hydropower as well as solar power because there is a dawdan dam which has been which has been constructed okay apart from that one important thing is it would what uh, uh provide water to the drought prone prone bundelkhand region okay this is the most important they taking water from ken and giving it to betwa they are creating a interlink in order to what decrease the drought i mean uh, increase the water table of drought prone bundelkhand region okay that is ken betwa interlinking project and yes i have already told panna tiger reserve is going to sink which is which is actually which has huge tiger population apart from that there is also a large population of vultures there okay that is ken betwa interlinking project here yeah. so you can see here so there is panna tiger reserve here there is ken betwa so from here there is ken river there is betwa river there is a project going on to be here okay they are interlinking and panna the tigers uh, migrating to here and here okay so we have Dur durgavati national park here and chitrakoot oh uh, sorry uh, ranipur national park sorry, sorry tiger reserve in up okay so that is ken betwa interlinking uh, project and durgavati tiger reserve okay clear yes now we'll have the last topic that is asiatic lion okay so yeah asiatic lion where is where is it you would have heard a lot of things about asiatic lion it is one of the big prestigious animal of india that is flagship species or charismatic species and remember it is endemic to gir gir landscape of gujarat it's only found there only in gir national park it is there okay in india okay and it is endangered Although it is found only there, its status is only endangered. It is not critically endangered. Okay, so uh, Asiatic lion is endangered, and uh, what are the threats it is faced? Yes, the epidemic is there, natural disasters, anthropogenic factors like poaching, hunting, etc. Okay, so there is only one single population of what lion remaining in the Gir National Park, and suppose if there is an earthquake happening, all the lion would die out, right? if there is some floods or if there is any disease spread all the lions would die out right so that is actually a threat okay and recently there is a canine distemper virus which infected at least 36 lions in this national park okay so it was actually a big problem now all the lions are vaccinated but still similar threats could arise in future okay so if there is a single population remaining it is actually a big problem okay so yes government has tried to relocate asiatic lions okay and i already told when i spoke about kuno palpur national park government was trying to first translocate lions to kuno palpur it was an ideal site for asiatic lions but then what happened since 1995 kuno palpur was identified as what alternative location for lion relocation the government has been asking the gujarat government please give us lions let us translocate it okay but uh why why were they asking yes i told you it is the last remaining population and if lions are only located there there will be very low genetic diversity and it is subjected to high disease threats it is uh, like whenever there is a, when there is low genetic diversity there is high chance that there will be what 
high probability of having diseases okay so uh, but what happened gujarat government told like it is up the pride of gujarat so we are not going to give you any lands we are not going to relocate it but uh, then uh, the case was happened in supreme court there was appeal to what uh, given to supreme court and supreme court in 2013 said that no you have to uh, said uh, to the uh, gujarat government that you must give what lands to other state you must relocate the lands okay so uh, so yes project lion happened because of that and yes uh, so many relocation sites were identified so uh, one of the most important sites identified was konopalpur but what happened till now we couldn't relocate okay so there was a project lion happening uh, launched by the moefcc in order to conserve the asiatic lion and uh, yes apart from konopalpur wildlife sanctuary there were other sites also which which was identified in order to re relocate what the asiatic lion okay so konopalpur is gone now because sita has been reintroduced right so we have six uh, other uh, what national parks identified one is madhav national park in madhya pradesh Ma madhav madhya pradesh from other national park madhya pradesh okay then there is sita mata wildlife sanctuary in rajasthan mugundra hills tiger reserve in rajasthan then gandhi sagar wildlife sanctuary so gandhi sagar you might think it's gujarat but it is in madhya pradesh okay it's not in gujarat gandhi sagar in madhya pradesh then there is only uh, yeah kumbhaga kumba kumbalgarh is there in rajasthan and one site in gujarat that is jessore balram ambadi wildlife sanctuary okay so we have two sites in madhya pradesh it is madhav national park and gandhi sagar national park I and mean wildlife sanctuary in madhya pradesh then three sites in rajasthan sita mata uh mugundra hills tiger reserve kumbalgar wildlife sanctuary rajasthan then one site in gujarat that is jessore balram ambaji wildlife sanctuary okay these are the proposed uh, relocation sites for the lions okay yes there is one new initiative that is lion and forty generation for amrit kal okay this is one of the new initiatives in news so to this initiatives what are, what is the government trying to do yes we told you there is only one single population remaining in gujarat's gir region so to this initiative the government is trying to conserve the lions in this gir region okay they are trying to conserve the asiatic lion in the gir region okay so how are they trying to conserve yes they are trying to what restore the habitats of lion the the grasslands or the uh, marshes of uh, where the lions happen okay happen to be like so they are going to secure and restore the habitat okay so that it gives an enabling conditions for lion to multiply that is lion and forty seven mission for amrit kal okay so uh, it they know that it could not be done by the government alone so they are taking the aid of the local communities so they are kind of giving them livelihood means okay and also they are going to create a global hub of knowledge okay based for the what diseases disease diagnostics and treatment of this big cats okay and also to promote inclusive inclusive biodiversity conservation okay so they're taking the aid of local communities they're giving them livelihood means they are also creating a global hub of knowledge on diseases disease diagnostics and treatment of these lions and also we are promoting what inclusive biodiversity con conservation through what lion participation mission for amrit kal okay clear yes so i already told one last population of lion is remaining where in gir but one interesting fact is that this lion population has significantly increased like from 1990 if you are considering the greatest census recorded a 674 species of lion in where the gir although there was death due to canine distemper virus there has been increase in what the lion population okay you can see the significant rise from 284 in 1990s it has gone all the way up to 674 in 2020 okay and uh, yes uh there has been increase in the what lion distribution a 36% increase in the distribution of lion area and also uh, what although there was a decline that due to canine distemper wire still there has 
been reported 674 with species of lion fawn. Okay, and how was it done? Yes, uh, the, there is DPS data uh, identification uh, through radio collars and pug marks, etc. Okay, so that is uh, what about lion project lion. Okay, so we spoke about the last remaining population of lion. Okay, well, vision lion for like cortex and vision for mental. This is important. Okay, then we also spoke about what the uh, project lion. Okay. The many major initiatives uh, of uh, uh, major translocation sites identified six new sites apart from Kono Palpur Wildlife Sanctuary, three in Rajasthan, uh, two in Madhya Pradesh, and uh, one in Gujarat. Okay, uh, so remember these sites. Uh, then also we spoke about what the relocating of Asiatic lion, the initiative. Okay. So, uh, also Asiatic lion, it is endangered. Okay, the threat is diseases, anthropogenic activities, and also natural disasters because also there was earthquake, right? Remember the earthquake that happened in Gujarat. This is also a threat to what lion. Okay, so yeah, that is it about the Asiatic lion. Okay, so I think we have discussed almost 18 topics today. Uh, so, please go through it. Okay, so the important topics which we discussed today uh, include like First, we spoke about the cheetah reintroduction project, right? Uh, then we spoke about the critically needed Asiatic cheetah, but that is not being reintroduced. It's only found in Iran now. What are we trying to relocate the African cheetah? Okay, we spoke about its habitat and also about Puno Palpur National Park. Where is it located? Then we spoke about Great Indian Bustard. So what is Great Indian Bustard? Yes, it is one of the heaviest uh, species found. A uh, flying bird found, and also it is critically endangered. Where is it found? In western parts. Okay, drylands and scrublands. Okay, the problem is the electric lines, and so the Central Electricity Authority has passed guidelines for in order to make it mandatory that uh, electric lines in busted areas should be underground. Okay, and uh, other conservation initiatives include projects great in busted and also the firefly diverters, bird diverters. Okay, so at least in, from 50 meters, where well, this busters can identify the uh, the what electricity line. Then we spoke about Indian pangolin and also red sanders, which are what identify the most what uh, spe the species which has highest illegal wildlife trade. Uh, we spoke about two types of pangolin, that is Indian pangolin and Chinese pangolin. Okay, then also the conservation status. And why it has to be conserved, and uh, it is mainly used for what medicinal purposes. It, it, its meat is consumed. Okay. Then we have red sanders, which is endemic to where? Yes, Andhra Pradesh region and Karnataka region. That is, uh, uh, what dry deciduous forest of uh, on the uh, eastern Ghats mainly. Okay. And uh, traffic has asked what to declare this region as regions of high conservation areas. Okay. And it is mainly traded to China, uh, Singapore, etc. That is Southeast Asian countries, especially for its medicinal purposes. Uh, it's cost. It is used for cosmetics. It's used for what dyes, uh, in car cost uh, textiles. Okay, medicines, etc. Uh, yeah, wood. Uh, I don't know what. It is uh, used for furniture, etc. Okay. Yes. Then also all the initiatives pick up. Then also we spoke about traffic. It is actually Wildlife Monitoring Network by WWF and IUCN. Okay. Then also uh, the Wanted Alive series of traffic that is uh, in order to conserve the tiger, leopard, snow leopard, etc. And cloud leopard. Okay. And also about Savan, that is South Asian Wildlife Enforcement Network, Savan. Okay. Uh, then also we spoke about Project Tiger, uh, which is an initiative by centrally sponsored uh, scheme by the MOEFCC. It works on the core buffer strategy, right? Then NTCA, National Tiger Conservation Authority, uh, designates uh, with the um, state government designate with under the what NTCA, uh, the uh, which is under the Wildlife Protection Act, which they declare for, uh, what the tiger reserves. Okay. Then uh, also tigers are what flagship and umbrella species. We spoke about the Global Tiger Forum, the member states are the BBIN plus what Myanmar. Cambodia and Vietnam. Okay, then global tiger, tiger initiatives. 
then the latest tiger reserves guri gasidas national park and the more pingla wildlife sanctuary in chatisgarh we have uh, ranipur tiger reserve uh, up uh, durgavati uh, madhya pradesh ramgarh visdari sanctuary rajasthan shivaliputra megamalai tiger reserve from tamil then we spoke about cats as conservation assured tiger standards which are standards which has to be met by tiger reserve when they trying to conserve tiger that is a set of criteria who who with who's instance they are doing it yes global tiger forum and world wildlife uh, fund in india global tiger forum world wildlife fund, fund india and ntca along with national tiger conservation fund here Uh, and also uh, that we saw certain site which has been declared accredited as what tiger reserves okay then there is tx2 awards uh if the tiger population is doubled by any uh, tiger reserve uh, then they would be awarded what tx2 award and lately what satyamangalam tiger reserve which is at the junction of both eastern ghats and western ghats was given this award tx2 awards then we saw the kelp forest Kelp forest uh, what uh, are declining? It's a threat to climate change. It has climate change change threat. Then what? Uh, it's mainly blah yeah brown algae and it needs what sunlight. It is uh it will be near coast because it needs shallow waters. It it will be what grounded on the uh sea bed and also it needs sunlight. Okay and it also needs clear water. Okay uh it it is what a foundation species. it gives food and habitat for many of the aquatic species and also it sequesters carbon and also what uh, shelters coastline from storms okay then we spoke about the kaziranga national park two things you must remember about kaziranga it is what in assam as well as it is the place where there is highest population of the one horned rhino okay then we spoke about the rhino which is vulnerable species uh, according to uh, iucn then also there is indian rhino vision which is one of the most successful program it helped to uh, translocate the rhino population and also what around 3000 rhinos has been conserved so far okay uh, then the eco sensitive zones there the supreme court has declared at least 1 km around uh, every national park or sanctuary or that is protected area should be declared as what eco sensitive zones Okay, then uh, all the provisions relating to eco sensitive zone and also the matter of gat kill and custody and come. Okay, uh, then also we spoke about bio biodiversity heritage site, which is declared under the Biological Diversity Act. Okay, uh, recently what Aritapati Biodiversity Reserve heritage site has been declared. Okay, apart from that, the other additions also we saw. Okay, then we also spoke about the Biological Diversity Act. It is in conform and uh, in conformity with what the uh, yes convention on biodiversity and uh, the objectives are similar. In order to conserve the biodiversity and also sustainable use of its knowledge and other things. Okay, and recently amendment has been proposed and it is under what final consultation stage. And also we saw the national action plan for vulture conservation, which is from twenty twenty to twenty twenty five. Uh, all the provisions with regard to that. and also uh, what the about the vultures the critically and remember the four critically endangered species which are what white back or enter white black back vultures slender bill slender bill long bills and also red headed vultures okay then we spoke about the valmiki tiger reserve which is only tiger reserve in where we had bordered the uh, nepal nepal sikkim Tiger Reserve, uh, National Park. Sorry, and uh, there also we also spoke about Durgavati Tiger Reserve. From where what Tiger Reserve, Panna Tiger Reserve would be relocated. Okay, and we also spoke about Ken Betwa Interlinking Project, and also last topic was the Asiatic Lion. Spoke about uh, its status that is endangered and the threats it's facing, and also the size which where it would be relocated, and also Lion at forty seven Mission from Amritsar. Okay, so yes, these were the important topics. Uh, we must we almost cover covered half of the topics, but the remaining topics we'll see in the next few months. Okay, so thank you.